This is David Prager Branner. My talk is Reading Classical Prose, Some Thoughts. Actually, the title is much older than the content. I thank you for your forbearance uh, because of where I am today, March 12th, 2021, I cannot easily live stream a talk. So I've recorded it ahead of time with slides and uh, I fear my skill is not perfect. So I thank you in advance for your patience watching this. Introduction. I have been thinking about how much information, how many words already seen, we need to keep in memory as we read classical Chinese, especially when we read relatively long periods. I won't address that larger question today. At the moment, I want to examine a tiny facet of it. I want to illustrate how the reading of classical Chinese prose as it was traditionally practiced in Taiwan, enabled readers and perhaps listeners to manage the long periods of the medium. Note that I'm not talking about poetry in general, but prose, classical style, unsprung prose, in which neither counterbalancing nor rhyme normally occur, and lines may be of diverse structure and length. This paper presents examples, recorded and transcribed, of how classical Chinese prose was traditionally read in Taiwanese. The readers are all highly experienced in the art form. Note that this is a form of traditional language art distinct from what I call cantillation, yin song. It's known as reading with bright resonance, lang du, that is to say, simply reading aloud. In the context of my own question about how much information one holds in mind at once when reading a long or complex sentence, traditional Taiwanese practice suggests an interesting answer. The manner of reading helps in part to break those sentences and clauses up into more digestible small units, and at times, also to give them a kind of moraic polish reminiscent of poetic performance. Let me start with a short sentence and then build on it afterwards. The sentence means interesting rocks were visible. A hyphen, such as you see at the end of the first word here, Gi marks a non-final syllable. In Taiwanese, tones changing is what defines a group of words. Every syllable has an intrinsic tone and a changed tone. Most of the time, a syllable is in non-final position in a group of words and pronounced with its changed tone. A double pipe symbol, two vertical lines in xie here, marks an end-of-phrase syllable in Taiwanese. There's no pause when that happens. Of course, at the end of every line of text, a phrase also ends, but I don't mark that. The Taiwanese tone system is telling us that xie is the end of a group of words because the word is pronounced with its intrinsic tone. Now, just imagine translating this information into Mandarin so as to perceive it in a way that's more natural. Most of my audience today knows Mandarin, but perhaps not Taiwanese. In Mandarin, we really don't have anything comparable to tone change corresponding to the end of a phrase defined tonally. But maybe we can approximate it with a short pause. It's not a very good approximation, but please bear with me. So below, I mark a short pause with a comma.
I think that to the ear, that sounds reasonable. Let's try something a little more complicated. This is from the Jiu Tang Shu, the biography of the Pingyang princess. There's a different reader, a different source. All of that is listed in the references. At the bottoms of some slides, there are scolia about certain pronunciations of interest or errors or what have you. It's not important, but if you want detail, it's there for you to read on your own. So this sentence means she, the Pingyang princess, sent Shao to lead several hundred cavalry hastening to Huayin. Ken Xiao Jong So Ba Gi to Huayin. Ken Xiao Jong So Ba Gi to Huayin. Now look at the double pipe marks in the transcription. Here the behavior of the tones marks out three phrases. Ken Xiao Jong So Ba Gi and Tzu Hua Yim. Now let me read it in Mandarin, marking the phrase endings with commas as I did before. Qian Shao Jiang Shu Bo Qi Chu Hua Yin. The point to notice is that the breaks are where we would expect them to be semantically. Let me go to the third example now. This is also from the Liu Zhongyuan piece. This sentence says, I adored it. He's talking about a small piece of land. I adored it and completed the sale. But as you hear, things are a little more complicated than what I've described so far. I've introduced a new punctuation mark, a tilde, to represent the sound of melisma. It's a term for music. It means more than one note sung to one syllable. I use it to mean that the tone contour becomes more complicated than in natural speech. That is an extra falling tone contour at the end of a single syllable. So in the first syllable, u is actually pronounced u. Melisma in this reading tradition seems to be a way of ornamenting certain syllables that occur before a pause. It's commonest on syllables of tone 5 in native numbering, that is the yang ping tone category. Melisma seems unrelated to meaning and often occurs on grammar particles. I can try to reproduce this in Mandarin too. I'll try it two different ways. Yu, Lian, Er, Shouzhi. How about reproducing the melisma too? Yu, Lian, Er, Shouzhi. I've left a gap in the recording because I think some of my hearers are probably laughing now. Because of the pause after the syllables affected in Taiwanese, to the Mandarin transcription, I've added the Chinese pause mark, the dun hao. It's described sometimes as looking like a sesame seed. Actually, it's what you get if you press the tip of a brush pen onto paper briefly. I think this is a prosodic pause of some sort, not a semantic one. It doesn't help with the logic of ideas. Possibly it just adds elegance by diversifying syllable lengths, breaking the line up. And in Mandarin, doing this would be highly uncustomary, but it's also delightful. Let's go to the next example. It comes from the same piece, and the line means, I hewed away dead wood and burned it in a raging fire. Not only is the grammar word zi, Mandarin er, ornamented and followed by a pause, but so is the verb ku, to get rid of. 
This would be very unusual in natural speech. And now Mandarin to aid your internal ear. That's certainly not how anyone would normally read this line in Mandarin. Let's try it with melisma. The main point is, I suspect that what's really going on is that lines are being broken up into smaller segments than are semantically necessary. Let's try another. This is from the splendid Jin Shi Lu Ho Xu by Li Qing Zhao. These are two semantically counterbalanced but not prosodically counterbalanced lines. It's a couplet. And it says, On my head I wore no ornaments bearing brilliant gems or green jadeite. Objects gilded or embroidered would not be in our house. There are syntactic breaks after the topics of each line, head and house, between paired two-syllable nouns, brilliant gems or green jadeite, gilding or embroidering, and before the attributive marker, Mandarin zhi, there's one ornamented grammar word in tone five, there is no, that is Mandarin wu. Again, no long phrases. Everything has been cut down. Now let's render it in Mandarin again for your ear. Shou wu ming zhu fei cui zhi shi. Let's try another. This is shorter. It's back to the Jiu Tang Shu. There's a semantic break after the phrase camped by South Mountain, and there's a possible didactic break after the main verb to welcome. There are no phrases here longer than three syllables, and that turns out to be typical. Here's the prosody translated into Mandarin again. Over a much larger corpus than I'm playing for you, I almost never find phrases longer than four syllables without one of the following an actual pause, or a tonal pause, by which I mean one marked by the appearance of the intrinsic tone category of the last syllable, or a melismatic syllable. Most tonally defined phrases are two or three syllables long, just like in poetry. Here's another. It's also the Liu Zongyuan piece, with a different reader. It has in it another feature that I haven't discussed yet. The text says, Now, because it's disregarded in this prefecture, peasants and fisherfolk pass by it and think nothing of it. The use of a double hyphen in jiuya indicates that jiu has its own tone and ends a phrase, this prefecture, while the grammar word ya, because, is tonally unstressed. So it's pronounced ya. Not all sentence final particles are tonally unstressed. Some are actually given melisma. Kim ki su jiu ya long hu gu hu go ji lo ji. Now let's try it in Mandarin. I'll pronounce the fifth syllable in the Mandarin neutral tone, although that's not normal practice in Mandarin, but this is just to express the Taiwanese with a Mandarin flavor. Jin qi shi zhou ye nong fu yu fu guo er lo zhi. 
Notice, again, there are no phrases longer than three syllables. Here's another. This is from the Shi Shuo of Han Yu. The name of the piece means an explanation about teachers. It says, when I seek someone to teach me the truth, why, how can I know whether that person will have been born before me or after me? Lots of melisma in this one. It's quite striking. Here's a translation of the prosody into Mandarin. Here there's an example of the particle ya in the neutral tone and another particle at the end given full melisma. Wu shi dao ye, fu yong zhi qi nian zhi xian hou sheng yu wu hu. Let's try one more. This is from the same Han Yu piece. It says, since people do not know the truth when they're born, who can be free of delusion? Nin hui xing yi di ji jia, xiao ling wu xie. Hui is unusual. It's prolonged and apparently melismatic, as though at the end of a phrase. But it also displays its changed tone contour rather than the intrinsic one. I have the sense that in this case the word is being emphasized, making this a case of semantic clarification. Jia is another example of a tonally unstressed grammar word pronounced jia. And now an effort to approximate the prosody in Mandarin. That is in no way a viable classical Chinese sentence the way I've pronounced it in Mandarin. Using short pauses doesn't do justice to how tonally cohesive phrases function in Taiwanese, and they unspring the rhythm of the composition. But in Taiwanese, it has almost a poetic sound because of the three pairs of words, each ending in melisma. It almost sounds like a line from a piece of verse. Conclusion. Today, most of us read classical Chinese punctuated at least to the extent of dividing sentences with a single mark. And most readers always use texts with a full set of punctuation symbols similar to those of modern Mandarin or modern English. We know that historically there were no such conveniences. It's still possible to find older books without them. Punctuation is a kind of commentary, delimiting sentences and phrases and words even making latent meaning precise, identifying quotations, showing the relationships between words and phrases, and so on. I think traditional Taiwanese reading practice is likewise a form of commentary that at times helps elucidate the text, and at other times makes it more elegant. It does so in part by breaking periods into shorter groups, usually of two or three syllables, and also through ornamentation. As a dessert offering, I would like to end with a full paragraph from another piece of prose, the record of the inky pool, Mo Chi Ji, of Zeng Gong. This is 11th century writing. I think a piece of connected text gives a much better sense of the gestalt sound of this tradition than do individual sentences in isolation. Tui on Gunji Sim, Ki I Yin Ji Sien, Sui Iling Bu Yi Hui, Yi Yin Yi Gip Ho Gi Jia Ya, Gi Yak Yok Tui Gi Su Yi Bien Hak Jia Ya, Hu Yin Ji Yu Iling, Yi Su Hyo Jin Xiong Ji Ru Tsu, Hong 
This is an addendum dated March 15th of 2021 to the presentation as originally aired. I failed to say one thing clearly in the original version of this presentation about just how it is that what I termed classical style unsprung prose, that is to say Guwen prose, can be said to sound like a line from a piece of verse, as I put it, when performed aloud in traditional Taiwanese practice. Traditional handling of the ping zi, tonal distinction, was in accordance with the maxim ping sheng chang, zi sheng duan, which means ping sheng tones are longer and zi sheng tones are shorter. That was already enunciated not later than Ming times. And the maxim applies, ideally, to regulated verse forms, to lü shi, to ci, to lü fu, and to pian li, which people normally call parallel prose, although I prefer to call it counterbalanced blank verse for reasons I won't go through here. Although the appearance of melisma doesn't turn guwen into actual verse or make it tonally systematic, Nonetheless, it introduces a distinction in syllable length and syllable ornamentation, very much like that of those verse forms. People cantillating traditional verse in Taiwanese and other regional Chinese accents, and note not only regulated verse, but even non-regulated verse, and verse dating to long before the Yongming or Qiliang style came into being, people doing that also prolong and sometimes ornament ping tone syllables simply because that is the customary style in cantillation. The bibliography contains an essay of mine from 2016, which examines a major 9th century new Yuefu poem as cantillated in Taiwanese and transcribed into Western style staff notation, the Wu Xian Pu. The couplets are not regulated internally, and even the rhyming alone violates some of the rules of regulated verse. But the composer of the cantillation and the performer nonetheless prolong ping tone syllables. That is the custom. It isn't only that lines are broken up into mostly two and three syllable units, as most saliently shi are punctuated by the sejura. This pattern also occurs in ci, in ci pu, ci handbooks. The prescriptive models are traditionally shown with a prescribed tonal value for most syllables. But if you examine a number of ci, all composed on the same model, you generally find that the positions with the least amount of variation are those every two or three syllables apart, just like in shi poetry. Similarly in fu, beginning after the Yongming era, and in counterbalanced blank verse from that time onward, although some phrases may be much longer than in a five or seven syllable shi, both forms are decisively poetic despite their names. And in them, most long periods can be shown to be composed, that is to say accreted, of much shorter units, typically two and three syllables apiece. The final syllable of each unit is normally able to bear a sejura, and it is at the sejuras that tonal contrasts are normally important. If you'll look at the article of mine dated 2003, pages 113 to 115, this is newly added to the bibliography, you can see the transcription of a cantillated piece of counterbalanced blank verse of Pian Li by the same performers as in Ang 1999. So it isn't surprising to see this same sort of ornamentation in the performance even of Guwen prose, though I concede it lacks anything corresponding to a sejura. There's no predictable pattern to where the ornamented and prolonged syllables may occur in a prose line, and unlike in the various verse forms, in Guwen prose it isn't uncommon for the word at the very beginning of a line to be ornamented. There's one other thing I wanted to add. It came up in questions after the talk. I was asked whether this style of langdu is still common in Taiwan. It is not. 
For some decades, one might hear it mainly in Botehi, Budai Shi, that is puppet drama, and secondarily in traditional Guahi, Gezai Shi, that is drama with song or opera. But I look forward to revival. That is my talk. There are three slides of bibliography, and this is the end. Thank you for listening.